All right. So we're just about a minute away from the next um, session. So your choice is to stay here in track one for benefits of state BEOC programs with Persia and Molly, or if you want to disconnect and you'll find in the chat um, the link to track two, or you can always go to ahc2021.com. Um, there's going to be a great presentation on cybersecurity with Trip Hardy, the CEO of Reprivita. So we'll give you about one minute to um, jump over or feel free to stay here. Persia, Molly, just let me see if I could do an audio check real quick. I would like to point out I'm wearing AirPods. <laughs> Let's see if they work, Molly. <laughs> I'm gonna count on it. Persia, can you hear us? Hey guys, can you hear me? Yes, yes, okay, you're good. Yeah. How much time before we begin? About 30 seconds. Whenever you guys are ready. How are you guys today? Terrific. Good, good. Nice to see you back, Persia. Thanks. Making sure. There you go. All right, for those of you just joining us from track two, we're going to get started in just a few seconds with benefits of state BEOC programs. All right. Tom and I are in a contest to see how many people I have in my track and he has in his track. <laughs> <laughs> so far I'm winning. <laughs> of course. <laughs> All right, well, if you guys are ready, I'd love to get started with this panel. I've been looking forward to it for, for the whole summit. This is one of my favorite subjects. So we're gonna hear today on the benefits of state BEOC programs. And with us, um, you may have met Persia yesterday. We have Persia Payne Hurley, who's a private sector manager and yes. BEOC coordinator with North Carolina Emergency Management. And our friend Molly Daugherty, external affairs and private sector liaison with Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency. So uh, when I started doing these webinars uh, for the AHC last summer, I didn't even know what a BEOC was. And then I realized that um, through your discussion, people define BEOCs very differently. So uh, Molly, I wanna start with you on this question. How do you define a BEOC and how does it function in the Commonwealth? Well, you know, it's funny, um, Laura, I think most states, when they start looking at putting together a BEOC, don't really know what a BEOC is. And um, if you know, with uh, 50 states and some uh, additional territories, um, there's at least 100 different definitions of a, of a BEOC. So I think um, the way we look at uh, business emergency operations in Pennsylvania is we looked at what are the needs that we have in Pennsylvania and private sector integration is not an easily defined term. And it, when I first started, private sector integration was, um, the, the image that came to mind was the, the tide washing machines in the parking lot so that people could wash their clothes when there's been a catastrophic flood um, but they really didn't have any examples beyond that. And one of the reasons why I was excited about the session is because um, we started to define our BEOC, Business Emergency Operations Center, based on what we learned from Persia and the work in North Carolina. Because um, when we talk about really operational, what does the BEOC mean? That's really where the rubber meets the road. And I think two years ago when we were launching the, the BEOC in its, its current iteration, we described it as it's a way for private sector to have a guy 
Like it's really difficult when you have a, a state government with 80,000 employees and 40 different agencies that all operate as a single executive branch of government, but also as 40 separate businesses. Um, it's very difficult for someone on the private sector side to know where to go for information. And so in the very beginning stages, it became a BEOC and integrating private sector into emergency management was really about being able to provide some kind of an avenue to information um, for private sector. But I think as, as it's matured over the, the couple of years, what we're really talking about in, in, in a business emergency operations center is being able to leverage all of the relationships that have been developed when there's nothing going on so that when something is going on, we're able to work in, from the emergency management perspective, we're able to get information that's really helpful for us to better understand what's happening uh, with boots on the ground. Uh, and it's also helpful for the private sector to be able to uh, leverage those relationships to figure out solutions. So for us, the, the Business Emergency Operations Center is really a, a, a way to develop relationships so that uh, when something does happen, we're able to expand our what our typical network would be among emergency managers now really gets into uh, the business areas. And we do that because when we have any kind of event, even a, a basic flood um, for so long, emergency management uh, kind of had the perspective of, okay, well, we've had a flood, there's power outages, people need water, we'll send them a bunch of water. And uh, we'll send them these resources and we'll send them this. And what that does is it, it creates a dependency and the community doesn't have the opportunity to uh, have their own stores sell their community items or donate however they want to do it. And um, so really our, our BEOC, although it's to better manage events so that businesses can continue, continue functioning, um, it's also so that our communities are better served uh, when something does happen. And you can't do that when something happens. You have to do that before when there's nothing going on. So you're better able to, to build those relationships and you know how to call, but you know who to call. I know, Prisha, I'm curious kind of what, how you would define, because the function is similar, but how you go about it is a bit different. No, no, that's, that's true. Um, you know, like you mentioned, we, you know, when we talk about BEOCs, we talk about a lot of things. And, uh, and in general, I think everybody, at least on the emergency management side, we kind of agree that it should be some types of communications hub. We talk about that. Uh, a communications hub, um, a point where business can connect in the government. You know, we, we talk about this. Um, a place where there can be collaboration and communication and cooperation, and we can go off onto that. But um, in, in North Carolina, I think that, um, and it is true that it is all those things. Uh, and in our case, we've got a physical BEOC and a virtual BEOC. We kind of do both. Um, and we, um, I found that our BEOC is really, it's, it's part of the emergency response team. That's what our BEOC is. I mean, we are, growing into a power factor in response and recovery as well. But, you know, we are part of those arms and legs that make North Carolina emergency management operational and functional in all of those areas like plans, operations, human services, infrastructure. We are another functional area for this organization. And that's, that's kind of how we were originally built, you know, set up to be the, that the, uh, my director, he, he, Mike Sperber, he wanted us to be a functional area. That was a dream of his, that this would kind of happen. Um, but um, it was tough for me too. And I, I was laughing at what you said, because uh, when I got here, I had never heard of a BEOC. Uh, emergency management was not my background, but I was uh, good at building relationships. Uh, and uh, he said to me, yeah, that's what we want you to do, build relationships. But um, 
over the years, of course, and since we started, and since we had a hurricane pretty quickly after I got here, I really realized, holy cow, what this could be, you know, just understanding how we respond. And, and that's sort of what we grew from out of necessity, just like, you know, Molly mentioned, you know, we, I'm a big proponent of create a program that is going to custom fit your state because it's going to speak directly to the needs of your state. Uh, and what works here may not work where you are, but some things that you can steal, I say, steal and use. So what is the BEOC? Um, it can be a huge asset in your organization if you really, really find a place to um, not just build relationships, but to give the private sector a role in building whatever you're after, preparedness, resiliency, recovery operations. So that's what I think. Yeah, and I, I love how you uh, recommend customizing it because it's it's not just steal and use, but it's steal, use, and adapt <laughs> or edit. <laughs> right. Thanks, Persia. All right, uh, next question. How has your BEOC benefited your operations and how has it contributed to your resiliency? So Persia, do you wanna start with that one? Um, yeah, well, you know, you heard me mention that, you know, I, I like the idea of customizing. So when you say, hey, um, how has your BEOC benefited your operations? Um, I think that, you know, we benefit in a number of ways. And when I say we, I'm talking about, you know, the government side, uh, state and local. Uh, I mean, we benefit from being, having um, access to ground truth, you know, across the different sectors. Um, to be able to uh, understand the, um, not just how those are, areas are stabilized, but how those groups are all doing cross-sector coordination and sort of making it happen. We get the benefit of that. Um, and we're able to share in, in our group the concerns of private sector with our leadership. So if they've got some anticipation of a problem, concerns, limitations, they've got some unmet need or some other thing that government really needs to intervene, you know, we're a direct line for them, you know, to uh, that, uh, that entity and leadership that can help. So, so it's important to note that private sector benefits, and, and that's important to us, that it's a win-win. It was very important because I asked myself, honestly, when I got here, I thought, if I were a private business, you know, uh, you know, why would I partner with government? And I mean, I think it was a fair question. So, it was a big goal of mine to make this a program that private sector would be interested, would benefit from, and could be an actual real partner, we call it true, true partnership in this group. So, um, and when I say that uh, they benefit, you know, not just from information that we get they get from us and help from us maybe, but, and we benefit from them in the same way, but critical connections are made and those connections can really um, really make the difference. I mean, some of these connections that we're able to make are, you know, what I call lightning speed connections. So, um, and I, and I want to tell a quick story that, um, that I was able to, um, that I got permission to tell. So I want to tell it. Mm -hmm. And that was during Hurricane Florence and Hurricane Florence real briefly, it was, uh, that's our hurricane storm of record right now, uh, meaning it's the worst one in history of North Carolina. So um, we are sitting in the BEOC we had uh, 30 or 40 uh, representatives from different industries and companies every single day of like a three and a half week activation. And they were attending briefings and they were talking on the EOC floor and they were you know, doing face-to-face -face coordination. So to paint this picture clearly, um, these private sector partners had a run of the EOC. So they're running down to DOT, they can sit with public health, they can go talk to Highway Patrol, they can go and um, look at what the National Guard is talking about. You know, they can talk to agriculture as well as plans, logistics, operations, all those different NCEM groups. So treating them like partners means that they understood the critical nature of the response involved in all the briefings. The benefit is that, as I mentioned in, in Florence, at one point we had 1600 roads closed, flooded. So Florence leaves our shores and, and just after she left, we were in that strange zone where the winds are high and travel is dangerous and um, a lot of people are still kind of hunkered down. But this is before the water really began to rise. We kind of had this pause in there. 
Uh, and we didn't expect the water to rise. We were just waiting for the hurricane winds to die down. So Walmart stores, uh, especially the ones that are most heavily impacted, like just on the edge of those impacted counties, they really had difficulty when their comms went down as those winds were still stirring up. They had no internet, they had no comms. Some of them were spotty on power, but the big deal seemed to be internet and comms once they got backup generator up. And uh, a gentleman named uh, Clinton Preston, he was a rep that Walmart sent to us from their headquarters. Um, he was sitting right next to a Verizon partner and he heard that problem coming into him from those stores. And so what he said to us and in, in, in the EOC is instead of having going go to the front door to try to solve that problem to get those stores up because those impacted counties needed support now, he was able to turn to Verizon and Verizon, uh, the disaster guys are sitting there and after a quick conversation, those force packages were deployed immediately to give assistance to those particular stores with portable towers so that those stores could um, immediately begin taking electronic payments and get that system back up again so the people in shelters could get that supported. And that's what I'm talking about, an, an operation that would have taken, um, he said that they expected going through a normal process 24 hours at least, where we had those guys that could deploy that force package right then and do it at multiple stores. So it's flexible, it's light, it's fast. And, and that's, that's um, to me, um, the way it, functions in our state, when we talk about being operational, that's just the, but that's the business to business I was talking about there that the private sector gets from being here and seeing the big picture and understanding what's cap what, you know, what the capabilities are, not just from us, but from folks that are in the EOC. Okay. I can get pumped up. So I'm just going <laughs> to try to calm down. I'm going to try to calm down right now. But, and, and cause Molly, I think that you know, we talked about this before because Molly and I are, you guys should know, we're, we're, we're talking through these disasters all the time. So she's having a bad snowstorm. I'll call her and say, how's it looking? And, and right now with this weather coming in her direction, I mean, I, I, you know, I want you to give, you know, our audience a, an idea of the kinds of things you do, your battle rhythm, your communications to folks, the, how people are dependent on that information for transportation you know, on the turnpike where you don't have all those exits every, what, two miles, like, you know, say we do here. Right. right. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So um, in Pennsylvania, uh, I'll give a, a, a couple of examples of, of what Purge is talking about with, with um, our roads. But the, when I, I mentioned earlier the relationships, and I think that's really one of the most important things that that these programs are able to do is develop those relationships. So um, to give you an example, something as simple as um, better understanding, you know, during the, um, some of the, the uh, uprising around uh, the inauguration, um, it, one of the indicators for there being large groups was knowing that hotels around Washington DC uh, were all full. So they had a far better sense that there were going to be a lot of people coming in from out of town. And um, so when we were planning for the inauguration, one of the ways that we've really benefited is being able to have two-way trusted communications with our partners. And they know that the information is going to be treated uh, respectfully, confidentially, however uh, they prefer it it to be uh, shared and we do the same thing. So when we were looking at um, the inauguration, we have Pittsburgh, Philly and Harrisburg. Harrisburg is the capital and then Pittsburgh and Philly obviously are uh, large, large, urban large urban areas. And we can't fix problems with a 200 mile screwdriver. And we also can't call 30,000 hotels in these three areas to find out if they're full. And so those relationships, what's, what that, what's that, what that's done is we can contact our um, association for uh, restaurant lodging. We can contact a number of our uh, larger uh, hotel area, hotels that cover perhaps the entire state and find out 
what do the bookings look like already on a holiday weekend? And is it, is it an unusually high? And if government calls a, a hotel and says, are your bookings unusually high? And we've never had a conversation before. I don't know that I'm gonna get a whole lot back. Um, but th those partnerships, everyone is interested in making sure business continues and people stay safe. And so that relationship allowed us to be able to ask those questions. And then we have a far better sense of what to expect and know, we know what to plan for. Mm -hmm. um, when businesses have a problem, it will often become an emergency management problem. So something as simple as Persia mentioned, uh, our roadways. And if we have to impose travel restrictions, we have trucks along the side of the road and they have nowhere to go. Well, that becomes a severe problem, uh, first of all, for the trucking industry. And also for, uh, it's a, it's, it poses a danger. We could actually have small cities along the sides of the highway and um, people have needs, they have concerns, they have health issues. And then that becomes an emergency management problem. So in Pennsylvania, uh, we're, we're the Keystone State, but uh, we're also the Keystone State in that um, we're a major corridor, north-south corridor um, in the interstate system, as well as a uh, east to west corridor. And we have, I, I think it's the fourth largest number of uh, highway miles in the country. Um, and it's a lot of roadways. We also, uh, don't get great weather in the winter and we are not uh, flat like our portions of our Midwest state, sister state. So uh, we will often have challenges where uh, if there's an accident, um, trucks can't get back up the roads once they've stopped. If there's enough ice or snow on the roadway, they can't get back up the road. And um, we've had situations where um, I mentioned small cities, we've had people trapped on the highway for up to three days. And uh, we've had people uh, been, we have people that have died on, in, while they're stuck in those queues. We've had uh, babies born and uh, well, probably in between as well, but we don't go into that part. And so how we've benefited is we've been able to use those relationships and uh, really engage them so that when we're starting to look at what are the different ways that we can't stop the accidents. Um, and we had spent years planning for how do we respond when the accidents happen? And we got to the point where there, uh, there were enough concern that we need to, stop the accidents. So um, we developed a, um, a restriction framework and we worked with uh, multiple sectors and got feedback from um, over the course of months to develop a um, really a restriction framework that not everyone's gonna like it, but uh, it's able to ensure the safety of folks on the roadways and limit the impact to, uh, to commerce throughout the state. But what that also does is makes um, our communication when we are going to impose a restriction particularly important. And uh, it could mean knowing there's gonna be a, a commercial vehicle restriction on the road and they're not gonna be able to be on the road for 12 to 24 hours. Um, advance notice of that can mean hundreds of thousands of dollars for a business. It can also mean um, if we're able to get notice out to our partners soon enough, they know, okay, we're gonna have to double ship our supplies so that they can stage their uh, materials so that when a store does run out, um, they already have the, the truck there and they're ready to restock so that once people can get back on the roads, the food is there. And um, I don't know if it's like this elsewhere in Pennsylvania, um, the, there's always a run of uh, bread, milk, and eggs. And we've never been able to figure that out because I don't know that pancakes are considered a, a critical food item, but uh, bread, milk, and eggs are, are, are huge in, in these parts. 
from a snowstorm. But um, so that where we have that kind of win-win is we're able to make sure that our roads are safe and we're not draining the emergency management resources that are required to serve an accident being trapped on the roadway for three days. Uh, and then businesses are also able to find out as quickly as possible. Uh, we know that when we're going to, uh, that we're likely to impose a restriction, we can call a business. We know that it's not gonna show up on the news that you know, they're gonna shut down the roads and it's gonna be a state of emergency. It's gonna be crazy. They, uh, that trusted partnership that we have means that we can share that information and they will use it for operational reasons. And uh, then it really is a win-win. It means that when uh, we do have something that's happened or we have had to impose restrictions, our uh, emergency operations center isn't flooded. Businesses know how to plan. They know what to expect. We're all speaking the same language. And so uh, we all have that, that common planning purpose. And it's, it's made a huge difference in both emergency management and state government and the private side being able to plan and know what to do so that they can, they can continue the commerce and, and reduce the impact of, of our storms. So I, I hope that, that answers the question. I, did I, I, okay. It does, and it's a good segue to the next question, which talks about the vetting process and how someone can get involved um, in your BEOC. So Molly, if we can start with you on that. Yeah, so Pennsylvania, and this is interesting because uh, this is also kind of the, you'll see some of the, the nuanced differences between uh, state programs. Um, I think most states will say it's based on the relationships. Um, in Pennsylvania, we use what we call a, a trusted partner network. Um, and first and foremost, we want this to be a private sector led program with government at the table. And that's really because governments, um, people in, in elected positions leave. And we don't want this relationship to be a political relationship. It's an operational relationship. And as a result, um, we set up what well, we have a, a charter and it's where the, the private sector side looks at how do they wanna operate? How do they wanna engage? How do they wanna network among each other? And then we have the state government side, which is the Business Emergency Operations Center. And our vetting process is um, we will always reach out to a business um, to learn more about what their needs are, how we can help serve them. Um, and then we have an agreement and that agreement is a, we call it the trusted partner agreement. And we won't share information about their business unless they have said that's okay. And they don't share information that they've heard from other businesses within that network, as well as from our EOC, unless we've said that this is information that can be shared. And it, it can take some time to build that trust. You know, we. In, in state government, it's, um, there's a lot of information that, that we wanna share, but we also have to make sure that it remains in the context in which we shared it. And uh, same goes for businesses. They don't necessarily wanna say uh, whether they have particular issues or if they have a resource issue, unless they know that it's really within the context of, you know, trying to keep everyone safe. Um, it's one of the reasons we call the relation, those trusted partner relationships. Uh, it's a relationship by choice as opposed to a regulatory relationship. Mm -hmm. um, emergency management does not regulate any business or any sector. Uh, and what that means is then we are really able to keep it operational. So our vetting is there, there is no point that a business would, uh, if they've expressed an interest uh, that we would ever not include a business in this. Um, and we find that it really self-regulates through that trusted partner agreement. Uh, every business knows that if they have a, another business in that group that they've 
shared information that they shouldn't have, uh, that they're, they're not going to be welcome among that network. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it really does self-regulate. So Molly, are you reaching out to businesses more often than they are reaching out to you or? It actually is both. We will often, um, when there's, we send out, when, certainly through the pandemic in particular, we send out an update every day that has information, not just from Department of Health, but um, all of our state agencies that have some kind of information that a private sector is gonna wanna know for their operations throughout the pandemic. So, you know, our Department of Commerce, our Department of Insurance, Department of Banking. Um, and we will often get a request from a business that received that bulletin. And uh, so we'll talk with them. And I know I know Persia, because she's she set the standard for this. If there is a, a partner that has a trusted partner agreement with us, we have sat down. We've had the equivalent of shaking hands. We've learned about each other. We've learned about what each other needs. And so it, it truly is a, uh, a way of building that relationship. So we will call, we don't cold call, um, but often um, there may be something that businesses are working on, like a, a particular, we had a, an interesting one where some of the roads where we have restrictions um, it's a major throughway for some of our utilities and they wanted to know where they could stage some of their uh, trucks while they wait for the, the restrictions to um, be lifted and they wanted to pre-stage. So um, in working through kind of the challenges of, you know, what other businesses might have space that they can uh, use or our PennDOT park and ride lots. Um, often what will happen is there will be someone on those calls that says, hey, I know someone from this business, they might be able to help, or frankly, uh, any one of my, um, my esteemed colleagues from the other private sector uh, programs in other states will say, hey, we know someone that might be able to help, mm -hmm. and then that's when we reach out. Okay, thanks, Molly. Persia, we have about three minutes left. I have to give you a time limit. You know that or else you'll, you'll keep going. So <laughs> I can go. Um, I think um, on vetting, um, you know, our vetting process, very old school uh, compared, certainly compared to the very, you know, um, detailed process that Molly's guys go through. Um, we, I mean, I try to speak to every partner representative <clears throat> that joins us and, and that probably explains our, our you know, slow, steady growth. So generally these are operations people, security crisis response, business continuity folks. Um, and, and what we try to do you know, is get to those decision makers, but <clears throat> we offer them everything, but really it's a buffet. So companies can get as involved as they want or not. Uh, of course, our, um, we have, we give access to our crisis management platform, WebEOC, to our partners. So what also comes with that is, um, um, if they want it, is reentry certification, which is a statewide program I administer. There's an MOA involved with that, but that MOA is more about, you know, not going over to Harrod Hatteras during a hurricane and looting houses, you know, rather than a, a you know, some type of sworn oath in, in, in terms of information. Because what we found is that um, if we are gonna be partners uh, and if we're going to share information on something like WebEOC, that platform, probably, you know, you're not trying to share, you're not gonna share, say, you know, um, traffic light protocol red on WebEOC because that, that's public information. Mm -hmm. So once we got past that, we were able to find a rhythm across the entire division really where people began to share information a lot more freely. And if it was something that was somehow, I don't know, privacy related or something else, that's not the kind of thing you're sharing during a hurricane anyway. And we found that we didn't need that. So I talked to everyone, an MOA, yes, is involved in reentry certification, but generally this is a, a email to us at, um, to me or to um, BEOC at ncdps.gov is really all you need. Mm -hmm. and, but we do ask that you connect with us before severe weather, but because although we're pretty good, we're pretty good at doing like reentry certifications and things like that on the fly. You know, it, it's not a calm, comfortable process when the hurricane's coming up. But um, 
you know, we can do it, but we'd rather not. You know, in, in terms of COVID, I need to say something just briefly about that. And that is that, you know, since the um, pandemic and yeah, we're like at day 384 or something like that, we have picked up 250 hotel partners to do non-congregate sheltering, meaning private sheltering, individual sheltering, rather than mass sheltering, especially during hurricane season. And, and that was quite a, a trick for us um, to bring on so many partners and to come up with agreements and things like that so that we could evacuate big numbers of people in a COVID environment during a hurricane, get them out of harm's way and be able to um, you know, have access to those hotel rooms or, and so we had to make those agreements. So, so it's, it's been very, very fast thing to do, but um, it just kind of gives you an idea of the multi-layered events that are happening, even though COVID's happening and we still need to do everything yeah. except uh, take the care and responsibility it takes to, to handle those things during a COVID environment. So, yeah. um, so we are a little lot more relaxed down here in the South on memberships. We want you to come by. We want to look you in the eyeball when it's not COVID related. You know, that's what we, want. we want to shake your hand, tell you, come on in the house, you know, have some peach cobbler. We, we feed you good in North Carolina. We do. So, but it's a, a lot more relaxed, but we do. Um, we deal a lot with personal information with companies, but we've got a very strong connection with those partners. It's difficult to explain. So yeah. hope, I'm hoping that one of them is on here so they can talk. Well, about actually, um, one of them is. And before we end this, I want to read what he said. And this is from Bob Crow, our friend. Wonderful. North Carolina and Pennsylvania are two of the best. And he put that in alphabetical order, not uh, any other <laughs> order. <laughs> are two of the best state, private sector, and BEOC programs out there. Thank you. If you're not connected, I recommend you connect. Nothing but good stuff. Oh, thanks, Robert. Well, that's such a great note to end on. Molly and Persia, before you drop off, if you wouldn't mind um, chatting to the attendees, um, your contact information, if you're willing sure. to do that. Um, and then I recommend um, to every other private sector company who's on the call today to reach out to your BEOC if you have one. Sure. Um, All Hazards Consortium has done a couple of 90-minute discussions on BEOCs with some of our states, um, and we have one coming up in early March with Illinois. So we'll send that all out to you. We hope you join us for that. Persia, Molly, thank you so much. Thank you. And if you don't know what to say, it's okay. Just reach out. Your, your private sector person will take care of it for you. Well said. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Bye, Molly. Thank you. Take okay. care, Persia. <laughs> Bye, everyone.